So I've started recording also too. I, of course, just want to uh, thank our sponsors, which are all listed here, before I begin. And at this particular time, I believe that everybody should be able to uh, put a little star on the whiteboard about where you're located from. I'm going to start that off. Anybody else would like that? Yes, I see we're coming from California. Anyone else able to locate? Joining from Berkeley. That's great. Belarus, which is excellent. New York City, which is pretty close to where I am. Excellent. Oh, I see Belarus got up there, which is great. <laughs> Very good. Hello, Irina. Very good. I'm going to continue. Today, I'd like to present to you a little bit of information about the Global Learning Circles Project. It's often been said that five years in the educational technology community is an eternity. Next year, the Learning Circles Project will be celebrating its 30th anniversary as a continuous running tele telecollaborative project. In fact, our numbers, diversity, and participation rate have never been stronger. And there's a reason for our unparalleled success. And I'm here to share that story with you, as well as some insight that I've gained along the way. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Barry Kramer. I am a fifth grade teacher. That's my primary occupation. I teach at Franklin Township School, which is a small K through eight public school district in Western New Jersey. We have about 300 students in our school. The average class size is about 18 to 20 students. I've been teaching for 32 years, and I received my PhD in learning sciences and technology from Lehigh University in 2009. I've been an active user of learning circles, as well as telecollaborative projects since 1988. Now, learning circles, I think I should begin by talking about what are learning circles. You may not be entirely familiar with the concept, but I know that many of you are. Learning circles are a variety of online projects that allow teachers to, to engage students in cross-classroom collaboration. And the goal is to promote student interaction, discussion, and also project creation. There's a couple different things that we do. First off, we encourage group investigations within individual classrooms. But really, I think the reason people come to learning circles is that teachers want to get involved in group investigations across classrooms worldwide. Now, specifically, when I talk about learning circles, I'm, t I'm talking about a project where I take groups of six to eight classrooms from all around the world and put them together to work on a telecollaborative project or a series of projects. I put together my groups by the age level of the students as well as the project interest of the participants. Now, why do teachers come to learning circles? Well, I think primarily, teachers are looking for some type of global education experience for their students. They're looking for to work together in some type of theme-based project where they can integrate their classroom curriculum. The teachers want their students to have some type of interaction with other students around the world. They want them to develop some type of interpersonal skills. And primarily, this is going to be done through their writing and through their project work. At the same time, too, Teachers are going to want to learn from each other. And one of the great benefits we find from learning circles is that teachers do learn things from each other. In the end, it's all about the project work, I say. But along the way, there's some things that happen within learning circles that you would expect to happen from a, a project-based learning type of community. We do provide authentic audiences for students. Our emphasis is on writing. but Increasingly, that is changing to be more and more use of multimedia. We do provide multidisciplinary themes. Ideally, we're looking for as much collaboration as possible. It's not always easy to do, but it's really our goal. 
And we want to connect as many students together as possible, too. I should begin by providing a little bit of a history of Learning Circles. As I said, it's a project which has been ongoing for almost 30 years. The project was originally started and developed by Margaret Rao in 1987 as part of the Intercultural Learning Network. But soon after that, in 1989, the AT&T Learning Network picked it up. And this was the really the home and the major development of the Learning Circles project. At about 1993, AT&T was forced to split up into smaller groupings. And unfortunately, one of the things that left or went by the wayside was the educational division. And so Learning Circles was going out of business as of around 1993. But in 1994, just a year later, Iron picked up the Learning Circles project, and it, this has been the home for Learning Circles ever since. I became the coordinator of the project in 2004, and around the year 2010, we worked to change the title of the project to the Global Learning Circles Project, simply to distinguish ourselves from some of the other Learning Circles initiatives that were going on in different places. Now, the big thing I talked about is, you know, what have we learned over the years by doing telecollaborative project work, and specifically Learning Circles? Well, I've learned a lot. I've been in this project almost from the very beginning, and I've seen a lot of changes happening. One of the big things that happened is, is that the mix of schools has been very, very different. And by that, I'm talking about the number of schools in North America compared to the number of schools uh, throughout the rest of the world. And initially, when the project started, we would have about six schools from North America and about two schools that would be international. Today, that's almost completely reversed itself. Most circles feature two schools from North America and six or more schools internationally. Also, I've seen a lot of change in locations. Right now, our highest level of participation happens to be in the area of Eastern Europe. But we've seen that shift. Sometimes it's Eastern Asia. Sometimes it's Southern Africa. Sometimes it's Northern Africa. I've also seen a shift and change um, and at times also we'll see a, a, a lot falling from the Middle East. We also see different shifts and change in North America too. Sometimes we'll have very strong Canadian participation. And then also I'll see throughout the United States, we'll see a, a changing of where different participants come from too. Some other things that we've seen. In the beginning, the project was essentially done through the use of online bulletin boards and email. But with the advent of the internet, that completely changed things. And so the project had to grow and adapt. And it has very much. Over the years, I've seen that um, more and more teachers want to use the new technology tools that are out there. And so the project has to change. One of the things that I've been trying to do is get us more in line so that we can use a lot of the new collaboration tools out of there. Initially, most of the projects used to be paper projects, but now almost all projects are digital projects. And I think that's a, because of the changing curricular needs of the ed, of educators. The use of new Web 2.0 2 tools for collaboration is completely changing the way we run things. We have to respond to the use of things such as Google Docs. Also, there's a lot of new apps out there and a lot of programs that teachers want to use. And so we're constantly integrating and putting them into our project. Another big thing is, is this idea of where students actually communicate. For many years, we've been promoting getting students to communicate within our Iron Collabor Collaboration Center. And that's a great place because it's a very safe place for students. But increasingly, teachers want to create things that are outside on the web. And each teacher has their own place where they want to put their work and they want their students to create work. So we have to adapt and change to do that also too. I see there's been a question posted about uh, why do I think um, there's been a shift in where participants come from. Primarily, most of our participants are members of the IRON network. And I think one of the things that happens, of course, is, is that as different schools come into the IRON network, if there's a new initiative, particularly like schools, 
in Middle East or schools in Africa, then we see a great influx of participants coming from those particular areas. But one of the things that I see, I've often seen is that, interestingly, through learning circles, I see that there are a lot of changes that happen. And I get to see some of these things as they happen and take place. As an example, when I see a lot of schools in Eastern Europe communicating, it says to me that there, there's something good going on there, that there's an initiative for global education going on there, and they're looking to reach out to the world. I've seen this very interesting. One of the um, countries which kind of drops in and out is the country of Iran. For many years, Iran was one of our strongest participants. And then as the dialogue between the United States and, of course, between much of the rest of the world and Iran changed, we saw that uh, Iran dropped out for a period of a few years. But interestingly enough, they popped back in again. And that suggests to me that there's some shift or changes that are going on within the countries that are allowing for more open communication. Sometimes we see some countries come on real strong. We saw that particularly with Eastern Asia. And then they kind of pull back a little bit. So I think there's a lot of interesting things going on in regards to that that can be learned from the process. These are some of the tools that teachers like to use. And as new tools come out, every session I'm being introduced to new tools the teacher want to use. And we have to somehow find a way to get access and provide some education to help teachers use these. And we've been pretty successful in doing this. Again, collaboration. Online, it used to be wikis for quite a while. But increasingly, I'm seeing that teachers want to make use of uh, Google technologies. And that seems to be something that's becoming very, very popular. One of the things that's very popular, particularly with teachers in Eastern Europe, is they like to have a lot of ongoing project blogs. And so because of this, this is a place where they like to post all their work. They also like to um, have other students from other countries post their work. But again, this is all outside of our safe space of the Iron Collaboration Center. And so because of this, this is one thing that uh, we always have to have a, a nice balance between where work and where student work happens. This has been pretty successful, though. Generally, we have a lot of duplication. We'll keep things within our side of our collaboration center, but also go outside depending on what the teacher wants to do with it. We run two sessions of learning circles each year. The first session begins on September 30th and ends in, around January 15th. The second session begins on January 30th and ends in and around May 15th. Looking at the numbers, how many things do we do each session? Well, generally, the number of projects, I'm working anywhere from 10 to 14. And I've had more than that, but it never drops below 10. The number of classrooms involved in each session is generally somewhere between 100 and 125. And again, it rarely ever drops below 100. And I've been up to over 150 already. Based on that, I can say that generally, we're serving the needs of about 200, 2,000 plus students each session. And again, that's a very conservative estimate. Some classrooms, uh, it's not unusual for a classroom to have as many as 35 to 40 different students in it. And it's not unusual for one teacher to be working with multiple classrooms also, too. So we serve a lot of different classrooms and a lot of different teachers each session. What are the common formats people like to work on and publish? Uh, quite a few of the teachers like to do online publishing on websites, certainly blogs. The popular thing with Learning Circles right now is media presentations. Sometimes these are in PDF format, sometimes PowerPoint. But increasingly, I have a lot of participants who like working in movies and working with MP3s. Many of the teachers have their own YouTube channels. And so a lot of the communication is being done that way. These are some of our traditional themes that we typically offer each session. We always offer place and perspectives. One of the things about that that's great is that it's kind of a geography-based type of uh, project. And it's probably one of our consistently most popular ones. We also offer Computer Chronicles, which allows teachers to engage in 
non-fictional type of writing. And then we offer MindWorks, which allows us to engage in fiction. One of the projects that I resurrected a few years ago, few years ago was a global issues project. And we have two projects that run almost every session. One focuses on environmental issues, and the other one focuses on education. We also have some interesting partnerships. Our, one of our biggest partnerships is with the My Hero Project. My Hero, we run anywhere from four to six different circles each session for participants who are just interested in discussing heroes. And that's done also with, in conjunction with My Hero people who actually provide us, and we use their online collabor collaboration and project creation tools from the My Hero site. One of the things that's happened lately is that there are some very traditional iron projects that have been running for a while. And so because of that, one of the things that I've been doing is trying to develop partnerships. And we've had a really successful one. My City and Me is one which is a, a partnership which came out of many of the schools in uh, Eastern Europe. And it focuses in on looking at the kind of different ways students can change and understand their city. Money Matters is one that we've been running a few sessions. The Early People Symbol Project has become popular. This session we're running, running one on cities which have some type of relationship to rivers. It's called Our Rivers, Our World. We've also done projects, specific ones targeted at uh, books. One of them we did very popularly was the Bat Chen Diaries, which looked um, specifically at issues going on within the Middle East. These are an example of some types of projects that have been done by various teachers in some of these areas. Now, what I showed you before were the themes. Within each theme, each teacher has the opportunity to sponsor their own project. And these are some of them that haven't been done over the last few years. You can also see some types of schools which have um, participated over the last few years. And I think you can get an idea of the diversity of schools that we have. They really are schools from all over the world. And this is something that we're pretty proud of. We're pretty proud of the fact of the fact that I have schools with pretty advanced technology in North America and over in Eastern Asia, schools which have great communication centers. And then I have these schools which from time to time are still communicating through a teacher who maybe only has an access through an internet cafe. So that's less and less because the internet is spreading throughout the world. But we try and reach all levels of participants and try somehow to get everybody involved. And we've been extremely successful in doing that. How's the learning circles organized? Well, we have six phases that we go through. And this is really what we call the learning circles model. And one of the things I like about this is the very adaptability of the model. But these are our, our six major phases. And I like to say that really we start with a cultural exchange of information. We go through a product development phase. Students create work. They share work. They put together some type of presentation or publication. And then at the end, we bring the whole process to a close. And this happens within a 16-week period. We share information through classroom surveys. Some schools still exchange physical items through the sharing of what we call welcome packs. You can see students here sharing the things that they receive. This is pretty exciting, particularly for elementary school children. Many teachers like to create bulletin boards showing the work that's been done. These have become popular, and uh, they like to put pictures of them up and show who their participants are. We encourage, of course, responsibility and commitment. Really, the thing that we ask is we ask each class to organize or sponsor a project for the group, and then we ask every class to send at least one response to all the projects that exist within a group. I provide a lot of structure for all the participants, such as project idea templates to help them focus what type of information they're looking for. This is kind of an example. And one of the things about this I think is interesting is that this has been changing. Because of the fact that years ago, schools liked to just share who they were and talk about local history and things. But today, a lot of, you can get a lot of that informa information right off the internet. And so we try and encourage that um, each school provide and create topics which allow people to share themselves and share their culture 
and share things that you won't find by just doing a Google search. We have some authentic performance tasks, and we use this one for my hero a lot, to try and put students in the position whereby they can make choices. This has been very popular also, too. Of course, the big part is the exchange of student work. Students have to research. They have to work together. They have to develop strategies and all things of that sort. In the end, we ask students and teachers to make some type of presentation or publication. Almost all of these are digital nowadays. And they can be in the form of a website. They can be in the form of a blog. They can be in the form of a video. They can be in the form of a PowerPoint. And there's a lot of other different tools, the, the new Web 2.0 2 tools that teachers like to use. And really, the only thing that limits this is the creativity of the students and the teachers. And of course, the time that's available to work on it. But we see a remarkable number of projects. We also make a point of putting all the finished projects online on our Learning Circles website. And in fact, you can access and see all the projects that have been created over the past 10 to 12 years. And you can download those, view those. They're all available for anybody to look at. Here are some sample projects you can see. These are kind of the cover page of some of these projects. And we see a remarkable number of different types of things. It really just depends on the creativity of the students in the individual classrooms. And of course, our projects come from all around the world. Some are really interesting, some really diverse. We see a lot of group projects, final projects, which are put, to, uh, put together. And in the end, we close the circle. And that's an incredibly important part of the process. I think teachers come to us because they like the structure. They know when things are going to begin, and they know when things are going to end. I might also say, too, that we use this model, the Learning Circles model, for a lot of things at IRON. It's used for our 16-week-long project, but it's also used for the Global Teenager Project, which is run throughout Europe. And that's relative, about a 10-week project. We've used it for some beginner projects. We've condensed it down almost to about four weeks. It's been used uh, as part of the Chris Stevens Project, where it can run for a semester long. So this is a very adaptable and flexible model. It just really depends on what the need is and what teachers are looking to get out of it. And what's great about it is its structure, the definite beginning, the definite end, and the focus on share, of sharing culture, bringing people together, then getting involved in the project, accomplishing your project, and sharing your work on the end. In the future, we're looking to continue to expand the use of learning circles. We want to introduce more introductory projects and projects of different lengths. Also, this use, increased use of multimedia and video is extremely popular, and we'll continue to expand the use of that, too. We're always adding new circle themes. And the big thing is, is we're trying to develop a structure by which more and more teachers can get involved in kind of a beginning and middle end way. And hopefully, that's where we'll, we'll end up at. Uh, it's very exciting. As I said, our numbers and the popularity of the project is as strong as it's ever been. It's, it's grown throughout the years, continues to grow. And uh, I really think the success is just based on the fact that we have a good number of returning people, and we also have a good number of new people who join us every and every session. So if there's any questions anybody wants to post, I would be happy to, um, to answer some of those. Is iron free? <laughs> uh, it, again, it depends what country you're in, I think. And um, that really, we have to, you have to check and see. Iron, of course, is in uh, quite a few, almost just about every major country and quite a few other countries, too. So, and every one of them has their own different types of entry requirements. There is a small charge for teachers within the United States. But if you contact IRON, they will be happy to get that information to you and direct you to the right person to help you uh, get solved. How do we recruit teachers? 
um, really mostly by word of mouth. And we do actually, throughout the Iron Network, advertise every time the project comes up. We make quite a big deal of, of advertising. And then what happens is that teachers, the coordinators within each country, actually promote learning circles within their own countries. And that's how we pick up most of our foreign participants. There's a, an organization within each country. And of course, they send out newsletters and they send out um, different types of things they present at different conferences. And that's one of the things that we do. How do we celebrate uh, 30 years of learning circles? That's a big question. We're just starting to talk about that. But um, I'm sure we'll do something in a big way. Any other questions? Do I have a link to my presentation? I will put this up on the Learning Circles website um, as soon as I'm done here. And if, um, if you go to iron.org, we'll help to make that available. And um, if you just go to iron.org backslash circles, you'll get there also too. Uh, I think on my next slide, I have um, some contact information. Yes, at the very top, more information, you can see the website. That's the Learning Circles homepage, and all the information I've gone over today is there. Excellent. Thank you so much. I know many of you are probably moving on to another session. That's fine. If you, I will be here for just a couple minutes. If you have any questions, feel free to post them, and I'd be happy to answer them. If you would like to write to me, would like more information about Learning Circles or IRON, Please feel free to send me an email. I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Irina. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for all you've done to help us over the years. Thank you, Maria. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Any questions, again, feel free to send me an email, and I would be happy to, and I will make this, um, presentation available as a download. I'll be putting up any minute now. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate it.